One from the OECD, where we'll hear from uh, Ambassador Hornblum and Andy Wyckoff about the new innovation strategy and document and, uh, and analysis that uh, they've been working on and just recently released. And, uh, and then we'll hear from uh, Ayesha Chopra about what the administration is doing. And then we'll hear from a couple of great commenters. We should have some time for a discussion uh, towards the end here. Uh, and, and dialogue will end precisely at uh, 4 o'clock. Let me start by introducing folks. Uh, let me start by introducing Nish. Uh, Nish really doesn't need an introduction, but I'll give him one anyway. He's the uh, first uh, chief technology officer that the federal government has ever had. It was a the president made during the campaign. Uh, and he serves that role as assistant to the president, also associate director of technology in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSPP. Uh, prior to that, uh, he was the fourth secretary of technology for the Commonwealth of Virginia. And uh, <clears throat> prior to that, he served as managing director of the advisory board company, a company here in Virginia, focused on uh, where he focused on uh, running a healthcare think tank. He and I both actually have the distinction of being named one of the top 25 doers and universal drivers of uh, government technology. But I think he was more for being a doer and probably a dreamer. Probably a doer and a driver, and I was just a dreamer. So, uh, and now I mean, she's definitely uh, a doer, dreamer, and driver. Uh, Karen Cornblow, who is uh, the US ambassador to the OECD. Uh, Karen was sworn in uh, to that position in August of 2009. Uh, prior to that, she uh, served as policy director for then Senator uh, uh, Obama from 2005 to 2008 and helped uh, author the 2008 party platform. Prior to that, she was the deputy chief of staff at the U.S. Treasury. Uh, she was also assistant chief of staff at the Federal Communications uh, of your International Bureau and uh, also worked uh, as an advisor to John Kerry has a long, distinguished background uh, in technology policy. Uh, Andy Wyckoff is the uh, Director of Science, Technology, and Industry at the OECD. Uh, and uh, you know, I've had the pleasure of knowing Andy for at least 25 years now, when we both, at one point, were at the former Office of Technology Assessment. Uh, but Andy really has uh, just done uh, an amazing job at OSTP to really bring innovation policy to life and get it at a much higher level of both analytical sophistication, which is really what Andy specializes at, uh, but certainly also at a much much uh, higher level of visibility uh, within the OECD and other countries. He said he's had a, a background not just at, o at, uh, at OECD, but also before at the OTA and the National Science Foundation. Um, at the very, uh, actually very uh, next to niche is Ezra Klein. Uh, most of you will know Ezra by the wonderful little uh, short, really nice columns in the Washington Post on an almost daily basis that are very easy to read and so insightful and so interesting. Uh, so Ezra is a columnist at the Washington Post and also at Newsweek. Uh, and he writes uh, an opinionated blog on economic policy, collapsing banks, cap and trade, healthcare reform, and pretty much anything you can attach a chart to. Uh, his blog points uh, to the honest policy ideas on the web, and uh, it really is a very compelling uh, new voice in, in, in economic journalism, and so I want to welcome Ezra here. And finally, uh, all the way to my left is Greg Ip. Uh, Greg is the U.S. economics editor of uh, The Economist, and there's a nice little article out there uh, from The Economist recently, a story that they did on the OECD plan. I think it was called the... Uh, uh, Growth on the Chief. Growth on the Chief. How do you get growth through innovation? Uh, anyway, Greg, um, uh, his career spans two decades in financial and economic journalism, uh, including a decade at the Wall Street Journal in both New York and Washington. And before that, was at the Financial Post and the Globe and Mail uh, in Canada. And so he has a long uh, background in economic reporting. He's had several prizes for reporting, uh, and it actually uh, appears to me from reading this that he is a Canadian. <laughs> Which I don't say badly because I actually um, was born in Canada. So uh, I think that's actually a, a mark of distinction and applies to someone who has common sense and balance. Uh, so, uh, case, thank you. So, what we're going to do is we'll, I want to uh, turn it over to, to Ambassador Cornblue to talk a little bit about the framing of this issue and why the OECD is so focused on this right now and 
how this is playing out really around the OECD countries. We'll turn over to Andy to dig a little bit more in depth with the OECD study, uh, and then Anish to talk uh, on this side of the pond about what's going on here in the administration, what they're doing, and then we'll hear from, uh, uh, from uh, our team of journalists. Uh, Eric? I want to start by thanking Rob for hosting this. It's um, really terrific to have this kind of discussion. I remember talking to Ezra a while ago and him probing and saying, you know, can't we have more nuanced, sophisticated conversation about competitiveness in this country? And I hope maybe this conversation and some of the work that the OECD is doing and that the administration, very importantly, is taking a leadership role on can help start that conversation. I also just want to um, thank Andy Whitecup for um, thinking of having this kind of roundtable in the U.S and Anish for the uh, real leadership that the administration is, is showing on this um, issue. So I'm the, I work for the U.S. government, and I'm the U.S. representative to the OECD. And so what I just want to do a little bit is talk about why is this important? Why would we be, uh, why would we as the U.S. government be talking internationally about this at all? Why don't we just hold our cards to the table, close to the chest? Why would we be coming to the table and wanting to talk to other countries about our secrets? And then thirdly, what are some key messages maybe for the U.S. from what the OECD is doing? So hopefully this will just sort of frame a little bit about what Andy and Anish are going to talk about. I know I can do this, but I'm going to try. Forward. Okay, so first of all, um, just in case uh, anybody needs to understand why we're talking about innovation is this a sideshow? Is this irrelevant? People in America are worried about their jobs, are worried about the future. Are we talking about innovation? And what I want to say is that this is the story of America invest, patiently investing in the future. And um, for me, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about Eisenhower and the highways, or Kennedy and the Sputnik education. I like to talk about Lincoln, because a lot of people don't know this story as well and some of the things that he did and put in place to create a national economy at a time of economic upheaval that is maybe analogous to our time of economic upheaval where we're looking at an international economy. And uh, so there's a picture of Lincoln using the telegraph. He was the only president to have a patent. He used the telegraph and really drove the use of that with the you know, great um, social challenge of his day. We had climate change, he had the civil war to fight, and he used the telegraph to really keep in touch with his generals. But as far as policy, he um, signed the Pacific Railroad Act and was very involved in uh, creating the West and getting the, the uh, railroads to meet up with each other and uh, span the country. The Land Grant College Act, uh, which spread research and education throughout the country. The Homestead Act, which developed the West. Uh, he created the Agriculture Department. Remember, agriculture was the cutting edge industry of the time, and the Agriculture Department was about getting the right data and getting it out to farmers. Uh, National Making Legal Tender Act. And then he was incredibly involved individually in inspecting you know, new rifle technology and what was coming off the very early um, uh, manufacturing lines as far as the newest manufacturing technology. So. You know, this idea of using innovation to create the industrial revolution, to create growth, to create living standards that we all come to know is as American as apple pie or as Abe Lincoln. Of course, Adams, you know, uh, John Adams uh, was interested in universal education, you know, Hamilton, FDR with electricity, uh, you know, Eisenhower in the highways. This is a very American story. Um, and just a little more history. I think a lot of the economic anxiety that we're all reading about on the front page of the paper, I think we have to remember what's in people's recent memory. And it's this feeling of, of expectation based on the post-World War um, economy where incomes doubled. A family with one person working 40 hours a week, year after year for the same employer, that family just was on this escalator up and their incomes doubled. And starting in the 70s, you see this flattening, except for the tech um, uh, period in the late 1990s, a real flattening. And so people, of course, financed what they expected was going to be their growing level of income on their credit card, on their mortgage, and now we're feeling that anxiety as they're starting to worry, are my, are my kids going to be able to live the American dream? 
um, is it going to be like it was in the post-World War period? So I think what we're, I just want to put on the table what the stakes are that this conversation is really about, about this. Um, so why would we be doing this at the OECD? Well, what is the OECD? Um, so the OECD is part of the architecture that the U.S. really created after World War II, um, you know, along with the IMF and um, the Bretton Woods Agreement. What, what the U.S. said was, Cordell Hull, the Secretary of State, and George Marshall um, said, if you're going to get Marshall um, uh, fund money, Europe, you have to come together and stop being protectionist and stop fighting each other on economics and create a level playing field. So they created the organization, what was then called the Organization for European Economic Cooperation. And it did, in fact, create a level playing field that the US business and worker benefited from enormously. Um, that organization, although it's part of this post-World War II architecture, is turning out to be remarkably modern and suited for today's environment. And I say that because what it is, is it's, um, I think of it as the most important organization I was ever heard of. It's, um, it's this organization where um, uh, different people from government come and they network with each other to share best practices. So instead of the least common denominator, you get the highest common denominator. One of the newest members of the OECD is Chile. And Michelle Bachelet, who's president then, she described why they want to join the OECD because it's the best practices club. It's where they can come and share their best practices and where they can learn from others about best practices. So it's a very networked model, but it's a, an interesting model where you build up and you don't enforce it through countervailing subsidies or sanctions. The way these things are enforced with principles, the guidelines, and so on, is transparency in another modern tool and through peer learning, peer review, and naming and shaming. So very modern. And what they're, what they're doing now is reaching out to developing countries, reaching out to the BRICS, and then starting to look at new issues uh, of economic importance in the new economy innovation being one, skills, uh, the internet economy. So innovation fits into this. Uh, Andy will be talking about this. The innovation strategy that just came out in May um, is modeled very much on the US innovation strategy that we will be talking about. Uh, President Obama's strategy for American innovation. The US played a very strong leadership role in crafting the OECD strategy based on the US strategy. This is an example of the US again uh, engaging, uh, once again, international organizations. And why would we do that? Why would we share our secrets internationally? Why, if this is about competitiveness, don't we want to beat other countries? Why would we share our secrets? Why would we go to this international organization? And it's going back to this idea of our enlightened self-interest. If we don't want other countries to think that the way to grow is to have protectionist policies or to subsidize their national champions, but if in fact we think that the right way for them to grow in the best way for us to benefit is a level playing field, then we want them to realize that growth is based on a good education system, a good broadband system, you know, this kind of platform approach. Also, it's a way for us to get metrics and to benchmark how we're doing. Um, it's a, uh, there's a new, um, you know, just as Lincoln had the Civil War as a social challenge that uh, he was organizing some innovation around, we now have global social challenges. So countries have to cooperate if they're gonna solve, let's say, climate change using innovation. And we also have global supply chains. So um, uh, co companies and countries are learning from each other. And, um, and then a, a global platform just says there were the railroads in Lincoln's day, there's the internet. And you know, Secretary Clinton and others have talked about the need for one internet, you know, if companies, especially US companies, are going to be competing uh, around the world. So there's a lot of reasons for us to be going to this international organization to work on this. And that, that's what we've done you'll hear about the really exciting work that's, that's come out of that. Um, so what are some key messages that I just want you to listen for while Andy's talking and maybe we can come back to later? One is, how do we capture value from U.S. workers? That's really the big question. We looked at that chart of, you know, we had rising living standards and maybe they're flattening out a bit. In this whole globalized world with all these new competitors, if you've got global supply chains, global challenges, how do you capture value here at home in the U.S. for U.S. workers? This is a really hard question. I don't think we have answers, but some things that obviously um, are at the top of the list are educating people, uh, customers, more important than ever when um, innovation is so customer-driven, products are often invented by customers, uh, workers, assets, uh, education. The U.S. used to lead in terms of percentage of um, college graduates. 
Okay, but we're trying to get there again. We have the Race to the Top program at the Department of Education. So we're, we're obviously focused on that in the U.S. And then there's maintaining our competitive advantage in knowledge. So um, I guess uh, Andy will talk a little bit about how we haven't lost that yet, but maybe we can't be complacent. I think there's disagreement about the things we have, have that debate. But certainly, um, we've had a competitive advantage in research universities in terms of the platform, uh, especially um, the internet. Uh, I think there's a new, whole new initiative we've got in terms of access to government data, again, the knowledge sharing that's going to be important to innovation, IPR, and this new creation of knowledge markets. We'll talk about all this. Um, again, how do we capture value? We have to unleash innovation and grow small or new firms. Um, and then we have to make sure that we have well-functioning markets here. And then again, how do we organize to address these new social challenges? So that's some of the ways we're going to capture the value here. Um, Another mess, key message to listen for is, is the open internet. So those are two different words, right? Internet, key, broadband deployment, but also open. Is that a new platform for the 21st century, the way the railroad was for Lincoln, the highways were for Eisenhower, electricity was for FDR? Um, is this a key platform that we need to really worry about? Um, and the OECD has said that it is, in fact, that the internet and the broader ICT sector is a driver of productivity and economic growth. They have some statistics that go beyond, uh, behind that. Not as many as we would like, but some. Um, the OECD has said that it's important to invest in broadband and uphold the open, free, decentralized, and dynamic nature of the internet to get this kind of innovation we're talking about. Um, and so one of the things I want to say today is that the U.S. is um, Plan to play a leadership role on internet intermediaries for privacy and e-commerce guidelines and broadband work that the OECD is going to be doing going forward. And we're very excited about that work. We're also asking the OECD to do some work that they've agreed to do on new sources of growth. And we're welcoming that work. <clears throat> and then just the third thing, and this picks up on the uh, Economist article, Growth on the Cheap. You know, we all know about the incredible concern about the deficit. Uh, innovation is one area where think about that it's, as we come out of the crisis, how do we make sure that we don't cut back on the critical um, investments needed for innovation? We don't want to group everything under that heading. We have to be discerning, um, but but we have to, obviously, we can't um, eat our seat for it. And then what's the low hanging fruit? You know, what's the really cheap stuff we could do in terms of um, really getting big bang for the buck? And then how do we get two first? So how do we address the climate challenge or health care and also get uh, growth and uh, job creation. So those are some of the key messages that I take away from this exciting work, and um, I'm really looking forward to a great discussion with um, Andy and Anish and Rob. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. 
uh, of the OECD innovation strategy is how do you harness this? Uh, and first of all, you have to understand how it's maybe changed to harness it to achieve those goals. And I just want to keep that in, in mind. Um, I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to briefly tell you about what the innovation strategy is uh, that, that we've done. And, th and then I want to get into some of the implications. And I'll, and I'll end with what I think are kind of a targeted set of things you might think about in the US context. Um, this is what we call a horizontal project at the OECD. Uh, the, the, out of OECD speak, that means it's multidisciplinary. Uh, we have an organization that basically mirrors most governments. Our directorates kind of map to most uh, agencies or, or, or ministries. And in this case, we pulled together about 15 different parts of the house to think about innovation. And this in itself, I think, is a distinguishing feature of the report. As many of you know, this is very hard to do. You're, you're, you're moving across institutions and against mindsets. Many parts of this equation didn't see themselves as being involved in innovation, the Committee on Consumer Policy. But at the end of the day, consumers are essential, I think, for getting innovation to work. And having empowered consumers, I think, are an important part of the equation. So this is a, um, but as a consequence, we, we took a pretty higher level perspective, and I'm, I'm going to show this to you. And it's only at that higher level that you begin to see some of the interactions across different policy areas and some of the conflicts. Um, let me just say that this is a small advertisement. There's a number of different products that came out in the course of this work. Uh, several of them are on that table. Uh, the 30-page ministerial report is probably the most accessible. But there's a USB key out there with everything we've done, basically. The full analytical report, about 200 pages. But uh, as you'll see through my slides, I think some of the uh, most interesting things are some of the work we've done on the indicators. And I think this is a hallmark of the OECD, is to push out the envelope a little bit on indicators by taking what are really creative efforts in one country and using that country as a locomotive to pull the train um, elsewhere. Let me also say that there's a, there's a URL at the end of my presentation where, a friendly URL, where uh, almost all of the uh, work is freely available. Um, let me get into some of the implications. And the first is, again, it, it's well known in this room. Uh, I know many of you out in the audience, you are way beyond this. But I would just remind you that policy doesn't really match up with this always. Uh, we know that innovation is a system. We know it involves a cult, constellation of different investments, and R&D is only one of them. Um, I guess I would hasten to say that R&D is critically important. And I don't mean to underminish this, diminish this at, at, at all. Um, it has been generally rising across the OECD uh, for some, some time. And it's through R&D that I think you get the breakthrough technologies, uh, things that cause a phase change, like microchips or vaccines or nanomaterials. I would also say that R&D, thanks to maybe work we did 50 years ago, is uh, one of the most easily observed innovation activities. Uh, and partly because it's traditionally been done within dedicated R&D units within firms, which makes the measurement here relatively easy. I want to show you, this is a new to world figure I'm going to show you. Uh, it's only because some of you who know me know I like data. But this was a very hard figure to produce, but one that I think is very interesting. Um, and I know it may be hard to see. It's on the USB key and elsewhere. Um, there are two main ways governments fund R&D. The first is through the direct funding of R&D, things such as grants, contracts, and awards. And here we've normalized this as a percentage of GDP. And you can see the OECD top of the class is the United States of America. Um, close behind, you have France, Korea, and some other countries. But what we've done for the first time is we've added in the foregone tax revenue accounted for by R&D tax credits. And when you do this, you get a different picture. And I think this is very interesting. Um, as I've said before, this may not be exactly apples to apples, but at least it's fruit to fruit comparisons, which give you a sense of the policy mix and where the money is going. And, and you can see a country like Canada that had almost no direct R&D has a very generous R&D tax credit. 
by comparison, the United States, which is heavy on the direct, is relatively light on the R&D tax credit. And when you rearrange these, you see countries like Korea float to the top as one of the most proactive in terms of investments when you count both measures. Well, that table has triggered some discussions, which I think are a useful thing to have. Do we have the right policy mix? And there's certainly discussions on this going on in Ottawa, but also capitals like Helsinki that don't have an R&D tax credit, and they're wondering, should they? Um, but innovation, we know, is much more than R&D. And some of you will already observe, the US is going to be missing from some of these figures, and I can explain to you why in the Q&A. But I think there's help on the way here. But uh, this comes from what's called community innovation surveys. It's something that basically a lot of Europe, but beyond Japan, Mexico, and other countries un undertake. And through the creative use of this data at the micro level, firm level, you can begin to separate the data into those firms that have a dedicated R&D unit and those that don't. And you find that for firms that don't have a dedicated R&D unit, they're still very innovative, uh, which I think is very interesting. And it suggests two things. It suggests that our, that innovation is more than just R&D. Uh, it comes from other types of innovative investments, design, marketing, organizational change. It also suggests that there's spillovers, that, that one firm that doesn't do R&D can benefit from, from other firms that, that do do it. Um, this data can also show us that uh, kind of, I think, confirm what is a highly stylized and agreed upon fact that open innovation or more collaborative in innovation has become very pronounced. And what this data does is it takes us away from just those anecdotes to, uh, I think, pretty substantiated data that shows that uh, this type of collaboration between firms is widespread. And what's more interesting, it's across borders. So firms are interacting, collaborating with other firms across their borders, which I think has some uh, implications for innovation policies, which are largely sovereign-based. Let me end this, this first phase by, by saying innovation is also multidisciplinary. We, we know this intuitively, and what we've been able to do through some of our use of patent data matched with the citations, the scientific literature that's cited in patents, is begin to look at this multidisciplinarity. We've created categories, so-called green technologies, a, a classification we've done in concert with the European Patent Office and the World Intellectual Property Office. And we can back out the scientific literature. And what's interesting about this is the, the usual suspects, energy, environmental scientists, only account for about 12% actually, of the scientific literature, suggesting that the, the other 88% are from fields that you might not think of as contributing to green technologies, but, but are very important. And I think that this uh, has some uh, implications both for how we fund uh, green technology, but also the governance mechanisms. What it means is that if you're going to reorient your innovation policy to so-called grand challenges, like green or whatever, and we see this going on really across the OECD, including in the United States. Um, this has some implications for our governance structures, which are mainly scheduled around or organized around uh, distinct disciplines and technologies. So this cross-cutting horizontal approach uh, is necessary, but as we know, it's not the easiest thing to do. So let me end with some immediate uh, policy implications coming out of this. Uh, I think as you move to this more collaborative mode, you have to erect bridges, uh, big, strong bridges, between different elements of the system. Um, you need to think about labor mobility. That's not such an issue in the United States. It is certainly an issue in Europe. But there's some recent work coming out. It's, it's slowed down the United States a little bit, partly because people are risk averse. They don't want to leave their job in an economic period such as this one. They want to hang on to their health plans where they have them. They're less willing to, to move. So it's not just um, Europe. But last but not least, and this is, I think, some of the most exciting thing going on in this country, is, is ICT. Um, and we begin to see informatics not as a separate discipline, but as a multidisciplinary uh, set of tools that you take to every field. And, and it has applications everywhere. And the use of public dispositories of information, places like data.gov, I think are really has some promise for it, acting as a new platform, a new infrastructure for innovation. And has has been said, we're in a knowledge-based economy, um, but we don't really have markets for knowledge. 
And what markets we have are very boutique-ish or thin, uh, and these need, need to be uh, developed. We need to be able to trade ideas back and forth and share them uh, much more than we have in, in the past. Um, the function of these markets is, uh, aye, aye, aye. okay, fine. I'm, I'm going to speed it up. Um, the mix of actors is, is, is changing. Uh, I think you, you all know this, the usual suspects are here. Um, but there's some new players here. And this is data we've used, uh, that we've mixed with uh, patent data, with uh, firm level data, and we can look at the age of the patent name. Uh, firm, and, and we see that for some parts of the world, young firms play a very important role. And these firms are the firms that typically bring in disruptive uh, technologies that uh, sometimes aren't accepted by large firms because they upset their business model. And so I think these firms are the firms that we should uh, have some attention to. And they're young, not small. Many small firms, particularly after the seventh year or so, will stay small. Uh, for, for their, their lifetime. So it's, it's a different set of policies than just small business policies. And there's interesting work, I won't go into it right now, by John Haltingliner, a little bit north of where we are now, that looks at job creation in the United States. I find this particularly uh, interesting work that basically says that all of the job creation comes from these small startups. You know innovation is not flat. I won't beat on that. I'll, I'll just say that this requires a, a interlinkage between the regional level and the federal level or national level. It also points to the fact that so-called framework conditions, things like taxes or labor or market product, uh, product market regulations are not the end all. There's some local conditions that have a big factor. And I would just point to the fact that, um, yeah, it is spiky. And if you just look at where R&D is distributed in this country, you see that five states account for 42% of all U.S. R&D. Uh, this, I think, raises some interesting questions about is it the intensity you're after or is it a certain critical mass or threshold that you need to have innovation uh, take, take off? It, it also uh, is a caution to people that want to compare the United States to Sweden and Finland that maybe that's not the right comparison. Uh, maybe we should be comparing Finland to Massachusetts or California. Uh, this says maybe we should compare Portugal to countries that uh, are Texas or Oklahoma or something. Um, I've known Rob for a long time. Um, I need to speed up because he, he, he is uh, going to keep me to time here. So um, I, I'm going to go over some of these a little bit faster. This is an interesting one, though. I just want to spend a second on it. It's looking at co-authorship of scientific papers with the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And what I find interesting here is if you look at third from the left, you see a new cluster forming within Asia, where Asia is collaborating with Asia, which I think is, is an interesting development and suggests that there's been a shift in the topography of innovation, um, making it a little bit more spread out around the globe. It's not just the G7 countries. I won't go into this, this figure. It takes too much time. Go to our website. This is an animated figure. You can play it over time from 1985 to 2007. And it tells a very interesting story uh, about the trajectory some countries are on in terms of moving up the R&D and the patenting uh, intersection. Um, let me just draw the implications here quickly. Uh, we're in a global innovation networks. Rules change, I think, when you're playing in these, these networks. You need to have not only the capacity to develop, but the capacity to absorb. Those are different skills. Uh, services, how do you, Ambassador Cornblum was saying, how do you capture this locally? And that's a very good question. We don't have all the answers. I'd like to hear some of your ideas. I think services play a big role here. Tying hardware with software is, is another component of this. Universities are important anchors that bring things down to your, your geographic area. Um, and it's important to build on existing strengths. Not every part or every region can be a um, biotech Center. Um, let me quickly go through the third point, and this goes back to, I think, what uh, we were talking about in the beginning. This is interesting work, I think. This is inspired by work coming on the Federal Reserve Board by Carol, Carol Carrado and two of her colleagues, Chuck Colton, who was at University of Maryland, and Dan Sickle. Um, and what they did is they looked more broadly at innovation investments than just R&D. 
They added in other investments such as design, firm-specific training, branding, software, and databases. And they begin to, to find out that investments in these intangible assets are as large, if not bigger than, our tangible assets, things like equipment, machinery, and structures. And then they ran it through a growth accounting model. And we, we took this work and we extended it out to a number of countries. And what it shows is that these intangible investments are important drivers of growth. And I think this is maybe the message we need to hit out more often. If you look between 95 and 2006, um, it accounted for uh, one percentage point growth in uh, labor productivity over this time period. And when you want to talk about things that matter, things like labor productivity are high on my list because this is how you increase the size of the pie. Um, let me quickly. <laughs> uh, so just to conclude, conclude this, um, you know, you try to think of emblematic 21st century innovations. Bombardier's C-Series regional jets is certainly one of these. Um, the Nespresso coffee maker, which I think is hitting the shores here, is, is another. This is a product that had a patent in 76, but it's only been catching fire lately. It's not a 1 billion euro uh, line of revenue for Nestle. Uh, but the, the, I think the best example is the iPod. It's a little bit overused, um, but yesterday's news just confirms it again. Um, these Apple's got it right, and part of what they've got right, they're not doing a lot of R&D. R&D is important, but they're taking it from others, such as Toshiba, who did most of the R&D, actually put it to the hard disk. What Apple added was very clever design, really good marketing, uh, and the linkage between hardware and software. It's the interoperability with iTunes, I think, that has made this such a winner and given them a huge part of the market share. Uh, I would just end with, um, where we began, um, yeah, this is a driver of growth, and now is not the time to be backing off of investments. Uh, to the degree the countries can, we're strongly suggesting that they support these investments, um, partly because they give you a double hit and help you deal with other global challenges such as aging and climate change that the countries are facing. Um, they don't all require a lot of money. There's some things you can do on the cheap. Uh, I think. Uh, the U.S. government has made very good use of prizes, which is a very interesting, uh, cheaper way to get innovation going forward. Um, but more broadly, we need to understand the role of uh, innovation in growth. Let me just, it would not be an OECD presentation by me if I didn't emphasize the need for better measures. We need better data. It is ridiculous that we have such a huge determinant of growth as innovation, but our measures are way, way behind other determinants of growth such as labor or capital. Um, my implications for the United States, I'll just leave on the board, and maybe we can discuss them as I understand. I'm probably over time. Thank you for your Great, thank you. Folks back there, please come on under. I'm actually going to Come on in, man. Come on in. Uh, anybody who wants to risk sitting in the front row and who has the opportunity to win lunch with a niche. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And it violates the ethics rules. Maybe we can meet a coffee or something. I said had the opportunity. All right, there you go. There you go. Sure. Do it. I love it. Please come on up and sit down because there are other folks in the back, so don't feel shy. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, uh, echoing all the thank yous and the great material that you all have published, uh, i got to tell you, it's a lot of fun to see the data bring to life a lot of that, which we've been debating for the last uh, year and a half. I want to get to the conversation, so I will indulge, if you may, a, a rapid-fire run through the current state of the landscape. Uh, with all due uh, courtesies and respect to my dear friend uh, Rob Atkinson, I begin with the implications of his report in the Atlantic Century, which is in many ways a call to arms for uh, our innovation strategy. When the president uh, uh, created my job, in many ways it was driven by the statistics that you'll see on this graphic. I uh, won't bore you with the material details, but I will say this. We have plenty of benchmarking studies about the global competitiveness of the United States vis-a-vis -vis other countries. And they may say we are one, two, four, five, six. The static measurements are interesting, but they are themselves not that sufficient for policymaking. The part that was intriguing was Rob's uh, focus on the derivative. That is to say, across a set of metrics from the year 1999 to 2009,
across 16 key uh, measures of, of, of global competitiveness and, and innovation on a change basis, the rate of change at the index level. Where did the United States rank? And as the punchline indicates from Rob's, Rob's work, the United States was 40th out of the 40 uh, benchmark countries at the rate of change. That's why so early in the Obama administration, the president said probably one of the most important of those indicators was the far right on education, the share of the adult population with college degrees. The president called for a global, a national commitment to ensure the United States achieved number one status in the share of our adult population with college degrees uh, by the year 2020. And a great deal, we can engage in the discussion about this and our education policy is squarely focused on this topic. It is in part why the President made the decision in the Recovery Act that while we were making immediate decisions for what, we, what ails our economy today, he made the judgment that in the Recovery Act he would include investment decisions that would affect a long-term economic posture. And to frame this, I had the pleasure of joining the president at a community college in September where he unveiled the strategy for American innovation, and it was a focus on long-term economic growth, what we call a framework for sustainable growth and quality jobs. Briefly, in three parts. There is bipartisan consensus that America is at its best when we invest in the building blocks of innovation. We believe there are three key elements of our building blocks. The first, as I said earlier, was human capital. We're particularly focused on STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Second, we are keenly aware of the importance of research and development. That's why the president committed to doubling the science uh, budgets for basic science and, and research activities at NIST, NSF, and the Department of uh, Energy's Office of Basic Science. But third, and I think partly where Karen had made the comment earlier, the need to have an advanced information technology infrastructure, which we believe to be a critical foundation for long-term economic growth. In the middle of this uh, pyramid, the president has said that we need to have competitive markets that focus on productive entrepreneurship. And while there certainly is an interest in ensuring focus on high growth firms that uh, Andy had just described, we're keenly aware of product development and innovations at the uh, corporate uh, competitiveness levels. In fact, part of my job is outreach to the CTOs at some of the nation's leading uh, corporations as well as the entrepreneurial ecosystem to understand how and what we might do to unlock the value of America's innovative spirit. I'll highlight a, a stra strategy in that domain. And then last but not least, the President did acknowledge that there are certain areas where we need to catalyze breakthroughs. What the President describes as an all hands on deck <coughs> approach. We're particularly focused on obviously unleashing this clean energy revolution. And in light of the conversation we had over the last year and a half in healthcare, to identify breakthroughs that will bend the cost curve, improve quality, and so forth. A word on these strategies, on infrastructure. A word about where we are on uh, advancements in IT. And I want to share with you the story, and I like this story because it didn't involve government funding. It's the story of Case Western Reserve University that adopted 100 homes in their neighborhood that are really the poorest homes in Cleveland, probably the poorest homes in Ohio, and among the poorest homes in the country. And they've conducted a research experiment that says if we provide a gigabit of connectivity, a gigabit of connectivity, to each of these 100 homes. What emerging applications might transform the quality of life for these families? And focus specifically on applications for energy efficiency, uh, improving graduation rates, uh, reducing the costs associated with chronic disease, and improving the community's public safety. This particular initiative is exciting because it's built on top of the Internet 2 infrastructure, our ultra high speed broadband networks, which you may have seen in the news, I mean, it didn't, frankly didn't make the news, but at least it was an announcement, that we are doubling the capacity of these ultra-high-speed broadband networks with a $100 million project, 75% uh, of it financed by the uh, broadband program out of the Commerce Department. Doubling the capacity of ultra-high-speed broadband networks in this country that would provide up to a 100 gigabit node-to-node -node connection point. We haven't even begun to think about what the students at our universities today could dream up in terms of applications that will be uh, the drivers of that infrastructure in the future. 
So uh, focus obviously on the wired infrastructure, but increasingly our administration is focused on the wireless infrastructure as well. Another story just in the spirit of no government funding, but catalyzing through convening power at the White House. I had the pleasure of announcing in February the Text for Baby program. While we were having this healthcare debate, Ezra was on TV a bunch of times talking about healthcare, we asked the question, why is the American infant mortality rate so much worse than anywhere else in the world? Why are we performing so poorly? There's an information gap for pregnant women. And the question was, how do you close that gap? Well, part of that answer is obviously insurance reform, but it also is something simple. We've set up a free collaboration where women who text 511411 in the letter B-A-B-Y, or Bebe in Spanish, get three information messages a week free. The carriers all waive the text message fees. And 50,000 women have already subscribed. And then I mentioned the fact that there's no government funding. This is simply celebrating and convening. Uh, women in Virginia, for example, when they enroll in Medicaid, now get a letter encouraging them to sign on to Text for Baby because it happens to be uh, something that they're encouraging uh, as a resource in Virginia. And I would add, uh, it's now gone global. Secretary Clinton announced a few weeks ago during the bilateral with Russia uh, that uh, the Text for Baby initiative in, in the US will now port over to Russia. The Healthy Mother Mothers, Healthy Babies Coalition is collaborating uh, with civil society to move that idea forward. And it's part and parcel with the president's commitment over the next 10 years to double the amount of spectrum that's available for mobile broadband. The president issued under a, uh, uh, remarks uh, issued by Larry Summers through presidential memoranda to call for that doubling of spectrum and has directed a whole panoply of actors in the administration to uh, move forward not only on encouraging uh, the right foundation for private sector uh, spectrum uh, reallocations through incentive auctions and the like, but also strategies to free up government health spectrum uh, in manners that are win-win for the public sector and for the uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, opportunities. R&D, as you mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, the president, as you can see from this chart, this came out of the fiscal 11 budget submission. The spike in funding, as you can see, is 100% attributed to the Recovery Act, but because of that initial investment the president has made. We are on path to doubling uh, those core agencies for basic science and research. And it's important to note, even in the fiscal 11 budget, while the overall non-military uh, 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 and, and, and public safety aspects of the budget were flat, the president did make judgments to increase research and development on the basic side up 6.6% in that introduced budget. And it's, uh, again, a point that is important to note uh, that we're making policy decisions uh, that reflect the priorities of this president. And, and also, in the spirit of the R&D equation, a theme you'll hear for the remainder of my three and a half to four minutes uh, so we get into the conversation, we believe the innovation strategy of this administration is in part to get the policy conditions right and get out of the way to spur entrepreneurial activity at the grassroots level. It's in fact what powered the administration, the, the president's campaign, it was people powered, it was grassroots power. As an example of that grassroots empowerment, the Commerce Department has unleashed a very simple challenge. Six communities will be awarded a million dollars if they can demonstrate how effectively their local grassroots ecosystem translates the research and development capabilities of their community into jobs, startups, and, 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 and so forth. The I-6 challenge is off and running. The applications were, were completed uh, due uh, uh, July 15th last week. And uh, we hope in the next month and a half or so we will announce the winners. Uh, the program that Congress launched was a collaboration that included funding from the NIH and the National Science Foundation so that collectively we'll have up to $12 million. That is a very modest investment, but it will shine a spotlight on the exemplars who've done a terrific job translating the research and development capacity into uh, job creation uh, with particular emphasis on our economically distressed communities. You heard earlier about this grassroots revolution that we've com we, are, we are embarked upon, acknowledging that government-held data in file cabinets in Washington actually is an inhibitor to all the creativity and entrepreneurial energy in the country. So we're releasing it. That's the president's call. It's what his first homework assignment was to me before I even took the job on the first full day in office, to create the policy conditions to promote a more open and transparent government. As one simple example, again, in the spirit of healthcare. Uh, every federal agency uh, in May announced an open government plan. 
It's all available on their website, agencyname.gov slash open. HHS says we're going to release thousands of data elements about the health performance at the community level. I live in Arlington, Virginia. What are my conditions and concern for my local community vis-a-vis -vis the concerns in Nebraska or any other part of the country? And they may be different. One of the areas that came up was, well, what do you do with this data? A lot of it, you'd have to go to a government website to find it. And one of them was uh, quality data on hospitals. How many of you, by show of hands, have visited hospitalcompare.hhs.gov? Cricket, cricket. Right, I get it, not many of you. But if you now search on Bing, and I don't mean this just to give a commercial to one firm, but all of this data is available to any firm, Microsoft stood up and said, hey, you released it March, March 11th or March 10th or March 11th, we released all this data. They said, uh, in 90 days, we'll come back and tell you what we can do with this. Now, on Bing Search, you type in a hospital name, and in the search results page, you get a little box in the middle that has snapshots of hospital compare quality data. This doesn't mean, you don't need to know that you have to visit the hospital compare website to get it. You get it right in front of you. By the way, Google one up them and said, we're gonna put this into our open APIs so that anybody can build any little interesting quibble about the data that they want. Someone in 30 minutes came up with, where in America should you have chest pain? <laughs> Fascinating, look it up. Uh, and I'll tell you a funny story about this. I was giving this remark in New York, so I pulled it in your thing. It turns out that there isn't a single hospital in New York that exceeded 50% patient satisfaction on the quality of how they slept in, uh, that night in the hospital. Who would have known? Again, releasing this data, allowing the entrepreneurial energy of our country to be tapped into new and creative ways. And by the way, what we decided to do, Secretary Sebelius stood up and said, we need to catalyze a national grassroots movement to take the value of this data and to make it relevant for you in your communities, whether it be to start new businesses or to provide social services, whatever the case may be. And so we launched the Health 2.0 Developer Challenge. Simple concept, we're gonna allow the community at large, all we're gonna do is feed it data from the government that you already paid for, and ensure that that innovative ecosystem can do with it what it wishes. And in, in this case, in just the last week and a half when the website went live, health2challenge.org, uh, half a dozen companies have already put up their own little entrepreneurial challenges. We'll be showcasing the best and the brightest during Health IT Innovation Week, October 3, uh, 3rd to 10th in uh, Silicon Valley. And the, what's beautiful, beauty, beautiful about the Open Government Initiative is that it's the gift that keeps on giving. You can have an entrepreneurial ecosystem in any one of these domains, whether it be health data, transportation data, education data, and the like. It's also about catalyzing breakthroughs with smart government, not necessarily more or less government. And a key example of this is the work that we're doing in healthcare IT. One of the key questions, there's a, again a bipartisan consensus that modernizing the nation's healthcare system through technology will lead to improvements in quality, lowering costs, and so forth. It's, it's hard to go from the conceptual framework of this is good stuff to having it be real in our personal lives. So I wanted to share just two examples of how we're trying to catalyze breakthroughs. One of the first problems we had that a doctor testified at one of our, our public standards bodies and said, I have a patient moving from Virginia to Arizona, thank you, Patient from Virginia, Arizona. Patient wants to have the records shared electronically. Turns out, by coincidence, the doctor in Arizona has the same software that I have. But, and all the patient's per, you know, permissions, stuff, and guess, there's no button on the software that says, send records to Dr. X. So the doctor said, okay, I use regular email with an attachment of the patient's record. And of course, while in testimony, heart attacks a flutter here in the folks saying, that's insecure, you can't use that, it's unsafe. So, pose a simple question. How do we safely and securely transmit health information from point A to point B? And it turns out there hadn't been a consensus standard for doing that. March 11th, that was a special day for all of us. March 11th, another day, we convened an open collaboration, nhindirect.org, a wiki where anybody could participate, 80 companies from Google, Microsoft, legacy health IT vendors, stakeholders, locked them in a virtual room and said over the next three months, you shall emerge with consensus standards for how to do safe, secure email messaging. I mean, that won't really simplify. And they did. They produced a, a consensus recommendation spec uh, built on the SMTP protocol that's gonna be prototyped this summer into the fall. 
and I hope will be production ready for the country early next year. It's simple infrastructure. By the way, federal investment into this whole thing, we built a website, hired a project manager, and convened. That's the spirit the President's call for. Finally, uh, again, in the spirit of research and development and its relationship to breakthroughs and innovation, we were able to fund four $15 million breakthrough R&D centers within the health IT domain. One of those four is a Harvard team where its program is called SMART. Basically, substitutable medical applications, or in their term, not mine, the iPhone App Store for Healthcare. What a remarkable concept. Professors like Clay Christensen, uh, Regina Hertzlinger, and a whole set of stakeholders in the entrepreneurial ecosystem in healthcare are working together with the team at Harvard to build an open platform that would allow much more creativity and ingenuity on applications that will improve healthcare, uh, improve all the vision that we want to see, increase quality, lower cost. And again, the health, the investment here from the public sector, a $15 million research and development investment over four years. Mark my words, you'll see breakthroughs coming out of this research team. And again, it's because we're tapping into that grassroots entrepreneurial energy that makes America great. Next on the list of things that we're gonna accomplish is on the smart grid. I mentioned earlier, this is one of those areas that catalyze breakthroughs and national priorities. No matter whom you, you ask, there is no question in anyone's mind, an effective and efficient intersection of technology and energy, uh, specifically in the efficiency domain, energy efficiency domain, will lead to uh, at least 5, 10, and ideally maybe up to 20% reductions in our energy consumption if we could get uh, the ecosystem right. You and I consume our energy and we look at it in the rearview mirror. I get a bill at the end of the month and it tells me what happened over the last month. What happens if you can access your data in six second increments, i.e. near real time? Well, this summer, thanks to the Recovery Act, 3,000 homes in Massachusetts are live, live, with a little box, little, little box, that captures their data in six second increments, connects it to an open uh, platform, open uh, programming interface, APIs, that allow that data then to be consumed by the household, handed off to any third party developer to say, hey, give me some cool application that will make it easier for me to make decisions about my energy usage, just based on the same data that had been available conceivably to the utility, now will be available to me. Again, a modest investment from the Recovery Act to unlock the value here. Uh, part of my responsibility is to convene a policy framework for the smart grid, especially as the Recovery Act investments start to wind down and we look to see a path forward, and we've had a lot of discussion in this domain. I'm done, forgive me. Uh, let's carry on in conversation, but this is how we're translating innovation strategy into reality in the administration. Thank you. try to bring in innovation to this sort of talk and not take up very much time because I don't actually have all that much to say. Like most people, I think innovation is a good thing and we should have more of it. About two weeks ago, I was in Aspen for the Ideas Festival. Some of you in the audience, uh, I saw you there. And it was interesting because two types of people were there talking about American public policy. One type were policy makers, people like Peter Orzag and Melody Barnes and Zeke Emanuel, Alan Greenspan. And the other group were innovators people like Craig Newmark from Craigslist and, and, and many others who invented things I couldn't actually pronounce. And it was a fascinating difference between the two groups because the policymakers sort of came out of this world where increasingly tractable problems were getting, were remaining unsolved at an accelerating rate. They're now on their, what is it, seventh or sixth extension of unemployment benefits and this one was filibustered three times and it's gonna be smaller, or still 9%. Well, the innovators came out of a world where seemingly intractable problems had been being solved at an accelerating rate. You know, computers were too big, so we made them very small, then nobody liked cords, so we made them wireless, and they didn't like using maps, so we put them on satellite. 
And it was just an incredible difference. And it meant everybody wanted to go to the innovator conference because they didn't depress you as much. <laughs> well, the other ones really did. And I think that implies two things. Number one, we're actually going to need innovation to accelerate as our political system decelerates. That you're going to need innovators to stay a couple steps further ahead of problems as we become, and I think this is not a terribly, uh, a terribly rare argument, as we become less and less capable of dealing with them through our political systems and become more and more gridlocked. And I think anybody looking for a ton of action out of Congress after the next election is going to be disappointed. So if you want to do something about energy, you better hope we're inventing it as opposed to legislating it. Um, the second question it raises, of course, is what is the role of policy when it comes to innovation, right? Uh, a while back, I was in, and I think I, I have to do this when I talk about innovation, right? You have to tell a story from when you went to China. So a while back, I went to China, and I was in Dalian, I was talking to software entrepreneurs and folks who ran a you know, software development park. And one of my colleagues on the trip said, well, why, why do people come here as opposed to India? I mean, they speak better. English in India, they have a more developed software industry. The guy sort of thought for a second, and he said, well, have you been to India? My friend said no. He said, look, you, then you wouldn't know. I mean, their roads are, are, are quite bad. Their infrastructure is quite bad. He said, and that's because they have a democratic form of governance. <laughs> he said, we, we have our problems, but when we want to do something. <laughs> and so there's this question of what does, I think, policy, what sort, of, well, I'm sorry, what sort of world does it create for innovation? And it seemed to me, and, and these are, I think, somewhat provisional thoughts, but it seemed to me that there were a couple of places you could identify from listening to the entrepreneurs. One, innovation is a little bit undependable. If you are saying to yourself, well, we're going to innovate our way out of the energy crisis, that may work, and it has worked in other things, but hasn't worked in healthcare, for one. So you do need a fallback system for if innovation does not come as quickly as one would like it to come. Number two, you need a structure in which innovation is possible. You don't want to be destroying the fundamental elements that would get you there. So Bill Gates was, was uh, I heard him speaking recently, and he, he was complaining that in California, they're destroying the University of California system. They're having ter terrible budget deficits out there. And so in order to close the very short-term gap, they are wrecking one of the real sort of crown jewels of future innovation. I mean, I went to UC, and it, it's, a, it's a massacre out there. So you don't want to be doing that sort of thing. You don't want to be limiting high tech pieces. You want to be creating a, a context in which if innovation is going to happen, it, it's going to be allowed as opposed to we can get somebody that we saw on time or we decided to not educate someone who could have come up with a very, very large breakthrough. And then the third thing, and I think this is sort of the, the skunk in the garden of things like this, is you do need to be able to watch and regulate innovation. And this is what worries me about this question of as our political system becomes less and less capable of moving quickly and we need to rely more and more on technological innovation. Just in the last couple of years, it's been a bit of a seminar in what happens when, when the world moves faster than we do. So the BP still, of course, is, I think, been a searing experience for a lot, of America's, a lot of Americans, precisely because we're not that used to dealing with technological problems we can't fix. We can go to the moon, it turns out, but we can't actually, with any sort of uh, rapidity, stop a leak a couple miles beneath the, the ocean surface. And uh, obviously the financial crisis was a lot of financial innovation that had a vastly outpaced the regulatory apparatus that was supposed to contain it, and down it went. And we've not been able to come out of that yet. They have. The, they've been able to sort of get back on their feet, but the, the economy certainly hasn't. So there also is this question of what happens when we need to really, really rely for both our economic well-being and to solve some of these difficult problems on a very, very rapid movement on, on technology. And you see this very clearly in energy, right? You see a lot of people begin to talk about geoengineering as it becomes clearer and clearer that an international cap and trade system with hard caps and, and all the rest of it doesn't seem terribly likely. And so you'll hear folks like Nathan Mirabal talk about how important it is that we just sort of all get used to the idea that someone, it's not the who, but someone is going to put a large flexible pipe up into the atmosphere and blast sulfate particles till it is cool enough for some people, and hopefully we can all agree on what the ideal global temperature is. And that, of course, is a little bit worrying, that we, we could end up in situations where we have moved much, much quicker than our understanding of what we're actually doing uh, has been able to keep up with. So that, I think, is something that 
is a, going to be a difficult thing to grapple with in the coming years as the need to rely on innovation becomes greater and greater and greater. And with that, I'll turn it back over to my sort of co-panels here who I'd very much like to hear their thoughts on that subject. Thank you. DJ Nathan Swarn, who's in the back of the room, who actually wrote that article uh, about your research end. Um, I've been thinking, and write, not, not nearly as much as VJ, but I have been writing and thinking about innovation policy for a little while, partly because I think, you know, as you were saying, Karen, that uh, it's critical to long-term outlooks for a standard of living and so forth. And uh, one of the volumes I came across was a book published by the National Bureau of Economic Research earlier this year, co-edited by Richard Newell, who is now actually the director of the Energy Information Administration and by Rebecca Henderson, and they pulled together lessons uh, from the history of federal uh, R&D policy and what it means for energy, and there's a couple of great essays by leading people in that I, I recommend it to everybody. It was a terrific sort of like crash course for me. But there's sort of two main lessons that I drew from it. One is that portfolio approaches to innovation are superior to um, large-scale demonstration projects, therefore syncrude, bad, you know, scattering lots of money on stuff like advanced uh, refrigerator compression technology, good. And it strikes me, uh, Anish, looking at uh, your, your presentation and the, uh, the way it's documented, that's a lesson that's truly been internalized, um, sort of like turning back on industrial policy per se. Although, Rob, you and I were talking about this, and there's kind of an open question as to why is it, Anish, that industrial policy is such a dirty word nowadays? I mean, our other countries seem to do it, and they don't, uh, they don't seem to feel bad about it. The other uh, main lesson I got from this research is the importance of demand in stimulating supply. So we spent a lot of time thinking about, well, what, what are the right incentives uh, to sort of like increase the supply of patents and technology and innovation. But one of the key lessons from history is that if you stimulate demand for this stuff, that's the most powerful incentive of all. So in the case of, uh, it's well known that the Depart Department of uh, Defense Procurement was critical in terms of uh, motivating demand for internet technologies for semiconductors and so forth. Um, a less uh, sort of encouraging example is that all the financial innovation that got us into trouble was in no small part a result of a ongoing bipartisan policy consensus that we needed to push home ownership down further and further into lower uh, levels of the income strata. So be careful what you ask for, you, you might get it. Um, so and he's listening to what you were talking about, health IT standards, classic example of sort of creating the demand. And, and if you create the demand, the supply will come. And it sounds from the anecdotes you gave us that it's working in, in a lot of these areas like uh, patient privacy. But as I look at you know the administration's emphasis on trying to like spur green technology to tackle things like global warming, I mean there's obviously a gigantic sort of like missing piece here, which is that the most obvious like undistorting efficient way to stimulate um, energy innovation would be to like price energy correctly. You know we know that uh, pumping lots of carbon into the atmosphere is a gigantic externality that the market is ignoring. And the most efficient way to do that is, you know, it's a carbon tax, it's a link fee, it's a gas tax, it's a, it's a cap rate, it's one of those things. And yet, when Terry Lieberman came up with exactly this type of proposal, deafening silence from the administration. And I think I know why, uh, but I'd love to hear you <laughs> uh, defend that, but just by way of saying, so we have an obvious example here where the economics is all more or less unanimous on what you need to do, and the economics is being ignored. Another thing that I learned, actually, from the, uh, this year's annual re uh, uh, economic report of the president, has a terrific chapter in there on innovation, is the importance not just on the level of federal support for innovation, but on the consistency and the certainty of that support. So there's been a variety of research that shows that the uh, temporary nature of the research and development tax credit is really toxic to long-term uh, innovative planning. And there, for example, in years when the uh, credit expires, you can actually identify a notable drop down in the level of corporate R&D as they all wait for Congress to pass this thing again. So, um, and we're exactly in that position again. So when I, uh, 
And you should have that chart that showed that lovely spike in uh, government R&D spending in 2009 related to the stimulus package. It looks really good, it's a great talking point, makes a great slide, but it's actually really bad economics. Because you basically said, okay, corporate America, we're gonna give you like this 20 or 100 billion dollars of money, but absolutely no promises that any of it will be around there in Europe, the next year or the year after that. And reading through uh, some of the White House's materials, there was a lot of talk <coughs> there about the um, support in the uh, president's budget for innovation. What I'm curious about is how much of that have you got? I mean, how much of that is actually in the budget resolution? How much of that is in the appropriation process? I'm, I have a genuine question, how far are you in terms of getting the money that you asked for? Because, you know, as, as I was pointing out, you know, the, the financial constraint on us is very severe, it's very real. I make a second point about what the literature tells us that is interesting, especially relevant uh, for the present, is that um, when you go through, like, periods of, like, really screwed up macroeconomic uh, um, variables, uh, like we're going through right now, that is really bad for innovation. I mean, the pro at a certain level, supply creates its own demand, but demand creates supply as well. And it's really hard to get people motivated to innovate uh, when the economy is basically flat on its back. We know from research by Josh Lerner and others that during the 1970s, this period of uh, stagflation was devastating to the initial public offering market for early stage uh, technology companies. And it arguably set back the personal computer revolution by a good five or six years. We may be going through something very similar now with the financial crisis having seriously eroded the integrity of our capital markets. That has produced a, a definite, I don't know what the numbers are, but I know the direction, and it's definitely raised the cost of capital. And that will have a very severe impact on innovation going forward. So those are, are severe policy challenges. That's one way of saying that. I mean, like, you know, if you're saying the you have to not well, you know, I mean, anybody who's dealing, looking at aggregate demand out there is like just depressed, right? And unfortunately, that matters for the innovation and supply side as well. The, um, uh, uh, for, for the folks at the OECD, I, I thought your report was terrific, right? And, and I pride myself on actually having read it before today, partly because of BJ's uh, article, and uh, partly because it, it uh, you know, buttresses the point about aggregate demand. But one of the things I think is very interesting that this report identifies is the extent to which the engine of innovation is moving to the bricks, to the emerging markets. Those changes in market share of R&D and patent uh, for uh, China, for example, are just stunning. And the uh, chart you showed about the growth in uh, collaboration across borders is also very interesting. But now that brings us into uh, a tension with another big concern that you hear all the time about the business community here in uh, the United States. Now, do, we know from the literature that there's a lot of, you know, we talk all the time, how can we spur more innovation? But a lot of growth comes from not spurring it, but copying it. You know, basically that is the whole lesson of Paul Romer's endogenous growth theory, that the great thing about ideas and innovation is that once one person comes up with the idea, everybody else gets to use it for free. And so Japan, one of the reasons Japan caught up to the West as quickly as it did was, for example, it made it a national policy to, to force companies that wanted to do business in Japan to give up their intellectual property. IBM, to do business in Japan, had to make its patents publicly available for licensing fee. China is basically copying that uh, model very Similarly, where essentially, if you want to be a, a joint, if you want to do business in a variety of strategic areas in China, you have to uh, prompt do technology transfer. And uh, a lot of Western companies don't like it, but they do it because they want to be in China. But in the last year or two, you know, there's been a lot of disillusionment about that. And uh, China's uh, Indigenous Innovation Initiative, which essentially required an enormous amount of government procurement to be restricted to, to, to uh, uh, Chinese companies, is created a lot of distress here. So I wonder, Andy, if a lot of that collaboration that you that sounds really wonderful that you're seeing is actually being done through gritted teeth by companies who feel they have no choice but to do that. And what would you say to a Western government, and this is not a hypothetical example that says, we're really concerned about theft of our intellectual property. We would like willing to look the other way when these are poor countries. We cannot look the other way uh, any longer when they are you know, first level competitors, when our companies are complaining that they can't do business in these countries because of the theft of that intellectual property. How do you reconcile that with the very good points you made about the value of collaboration across borders in R&D? So just for a few questions out to you, maybe you can get to those in your own comments. Great, I just want to 
let Anisha and Andy both respond to what the respondents said. Um, I have to say one thing. I, I said this earlier at lunch today, so some people have already heard it. But uh, I agree with Greg's point about, about carbon pricing, for example, that at some point you've got to put a price on carbon in your cap and trade or tax. But w what I would like would be for the economists of the world that who actually ignore innovation. There are some economists who don't ignore innovation, but there are many who, who do. Uh, essentially, Romer is one who does it. That's why it's called the endogenous growth theory. It, it's exogenous for most economists. What I would like economists to do would be to say, geez, it's so obvious, of course, with solving global warming, we have to have innovation. Oh, and the carbon tax. In other words, uh, it's sort of seen as like the carbon tax, the economist's uh, view is if you just have the carbon tax, everything's fine. And I think the correct answer is you have to have a carbon tax or some price, and you have to have an active green innovation policy. The two have to go together. And that's why I think one of the challenges with, with innovation policy and why it's so difficult uh, is because there are just so many economists who just largely ignore it and just assume that pricing will get us everything we need. And I think that's really a lot of ways why Andy's work and Anisha's work, the administration's work is so important, because they're saying, wait a minute, the market is a component of it. It's not the only thing that's going to drive that. So Anisha, I'm going to let you go first. And if you want to yeah, just put that. Yeah, uh, so first of all, great questions. Um, I'm going to attempt to cover the responses, but I'm going to deep dive in healthcare to draw the analogy, since that's completed action. I'm not giving you words that can point to action. So, so first, let me make the markets bet, bet. We went public with our framework for health IT in the year 2009. We signaled it, obviously, in February uh, with the notion that in the Recovery Act would be dollars to this issue. We, we proposed a framework for health IT, how the money would be allocated by July, so rapid speed. Uh, from a public uh, uh, discussion point, which was formalized then into rules in December. So you look at 09 as an example of the concept of this signaling of an important priority for the president uh, and action. Data. Uh, National Venture Capital Association said that overall VC investments declined 31% across calendar year 2009. Healthcare IT up 37%. Data. I would humbly suggest that a portion of that was because of, I believe, the model that we put forward in that regard. Second, your notion that policy and uh, uh, the technology, in, in many sense, now Rob is kindly attacking that kind of proposition, I would suggest that you go hand in glove, and I'll give you the healthcare example. It is great if we have all the technology in the world for the doctors to share data. But if there's no financial incentive for them to do so in terms of how they get paid, uh, it is unclear how it scales. So what was a critical element of the health reform legislation? It was the portfolio of payment reforms that not only were identified explicitly, the creation of accountable care organizations, uh, all the way through the Center for Payment Innovation, which actually is now institutionalized within CMS with authorities to demonstrate through prototypes how payment reforms might work with the authority to scale without uh, requiring congressional review. So data-driven, evidence-based uh, policy making on the payment side. Now why do I bring that up? Find me any healthcare organization that wants to be registered as an accountable care organization when they go live January 2012. Find me anyone that doesn't have an advanced uh, information technology-based strategy. Find me one. It is physically impossible to be an effective accountable care organization if you cannot more thoughtfully analyze your patient population to automatically query who's due for a diabetes check for foot to make sure they don't have a concern or who hasn't had their pap smear or whatever the circumstances may be instead of having some manual review of the you know who what does the staff think should be done one can do automatic reminders uh, patient education in new and creative ways by the way, all of which are part of the requirements for the health IT infrastructure. So the technology in and of itself, I think, was exciting. But combine that with health reform, and you have a combination of payment reform plus a, a better, uh, more innovative uh, IT infrastructure. And I, I, I'm, you will let the results show, we'll see a better uh, performing healthcare system as a result. So uh, we can go on for hours, but I just wanted to do a deep dive, at least on those dimensions that you identified. and. Uh, uh, suggest perhaps we continue. The, a lot of a lot of questions that came up, but I'll, I'll get those first. Great, thanks. Yeah, and yeah, Andy, why don't you use that mic and pass that way? Yeah. No, use that one. Yeah. 
U.S. firms acknowledge that innovating in domestic markets in growth area actually can be both a beneficial market opportunity in, the, in that market as well as to reverse that learning to help improve the U.S. supply chain. In fact, Jeff Immelt wrote a piece in the Harvard Business Review called Reverse Innovation, and uh, two thumbs up to the philosophy. It's happening, number one. Number two, this president has called for an unprecedented level of scientific and technological cooperation around the world. Dr. Holdren is personally leading a number of these delegations to bring about more scientific and technological cooperation, and I'm envisioning a great deal of that is taking place in areas where in growth markets they have challenges in clean water and you name it, and they're looking for ways to collaborate. Which leads to my point three, uh, we are in the midst of a strategic dialogue with countries like India, and we just had the first joint meeting about three weeks ago, maybe a month ago, where we announced that the NIH is releasing supplemental funding opportunities for low-cost medical devices that are developed in collaboration with researchers in India. And now there's a LinkedIn community of, of, uh, of researchers who are engaged to think about what are the medical diagnostic needs uh, in, in countries like India, and how might US uh, faculty engage in a conversation about uh, innovation. And it's not gonna be a lot of money, but the, the mere notion that community should be convened and it's part of the dialogue, I think is an example of how we're trying to bring uh, that, that thinking to bear. At the end of the day, the fact that Honeywell, a domestic auto supplier, is in the Tata Nano supply chain is beneficial not only to Honeywell sales in the Tata Nano, but also in the knowledge transfer that brings back to Honeywell's uh, domestic capacity. So that's just far what I think we're seeing in the marketplace. Okay, other comments? Yes. Um, I Could you identify yourself? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Dana Urban. I'm an investigator for the House Appropriations Committee. And uh, this is not taking back to my bosses, but I'm, I'm consistently concerned by how much CBO scoring affects our policy and affects in a, uh, innovation policy. The instance that you raised of the R&D tax credit, the reason the R&D tax credit keeps expiring and keeps being reenacted, and again, everyone knows it will be reenacted, but it keeps expiring because if you have a 10-year R&D tax credit or a permanent R&D tax credit, like I gather some countries do, it's a huge increase on the deficit. Now, everybody knows it's going to be reenacted. It's politically popular. And yet you have this basically an artifact from CBO scoring, or O&B scoring for that matter, that makes it difficult to do what is the right thing to do for innovation. <coughs> it's not the only example. I just walked out of a meeting with another agency where it's an agency everybody would say, here, you got to fund, you got to fund, you got to fund. CPO issue, it's a scoring issue again. Is there anything, anybody thinking about this at all? Can I just, uh, my colleagues from OMB, a couple of them are in the room, it has called for the permanent, uh, uh, the permanence of the R&D tax credit, and in the introduced budget, in fact, submitted that framework to the Congress, uh, scored within the proper, I'm not a OMB score guy, but, but the team did that work in the submitted budget because we do believe, now in my world, I talk to the CTOs at the firms that actually apply for the credit, and no matter what we may say in Washington about, oh, everyone knows and so forth, they're on the lines to do the job. They cannot justify the work that has to be done. So when they talk to me about priorities, they say very explicitly, the permanent nature of the R&D tax credit, or at least a, a time horizon that fits our investment plans, will actually affect the decisions that we make. So. Uh, maybe their government affairs office might say, oh, it's going to happen, but the people who have to put the project plans into work tell me explicitly that is a barrier. That's why the president has asked that to be made permanent. It's why it's uh, in our uh, submitted fiscal 11 uh, budget, and I understand I'm not an expert on how the uh, 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 congressional uh, activities are done in that regard, but it is a priority from our uh, standpoint. I'd like to make actually one point on this, if you don't mind. I think I'll push this degree. Which is only that, uh, so I covered healthcare reform, and so nobody bows lower before the CBO, and it's enormous power over American public policy than I do, and I spent many, many days in, in those white papers. But it is a choice Congress makes. I mean, it's what we, we do have a tendency to let Congress hide behind the decision of the CBO. And I've had many, many senators and many, many congressmen essentially all say the same thing, right? 
they all say, CBO makes decisions about the future looking at the American viewer. So they know it, and when they want to evade it, they do. This week, you've heard the Republicans saying, we shouldn't have deficit offsets for the Bush tax cuts. You should just be able to do it. Right. So when it is enough of a, and we did the same thing on Medicare Part D, incidentally. Exactly. So when it is enough of a priority for a political party, they are willing at times to simply throw out what they believe to be unhelpful estimations from the CBO. So even in the absence of a change scoring mechanism, and I do think that there are some problems with the way CBO does this stuff, you know, ultimate responsibility here does lie with, with, with electeds, and it, it is something that they decided to make it a priority they could do. I think one of the other challenges there, and this raises this entire hornet's nest to what's called dynamic scoring, which uh, you know, once you go down that path, you open up a lot of things. But to be fair, we have done modeling on the Army tax credit, and dynamically it scored really, really well. It pays for itself. Federal revenues. It just takes a little while for that to happen, but it does do it. So that's something that on our static scoring system, we ignore any of the benefits. And I understand the hornet's nest because the conservatives want to say cutting rich people's taxes dynamic uh, effects too, which I'm more skeptical of. But there certainly are some things the government does which generate you know, revenue, and we don't account for that. So, um, Monica McGuire uh, with the National Association of Manufacturers. R&D credit is near and dear to me. I've worked on it for 20 years. I just want to make a, a comment, um, and also I, I want to echo uh, thanks for the administration's support for permanent R&D credit. Your administration joins both past Democrat and Republican administrations supporting that. So thank you. I appreciate that you get it. Um, and Rob's exactly right. It's all it's all about static versus dynamic revenue scoring. The comment I have is the R and D tax credit is currently expired. It's the fourteenth time it's expired it's originally enacted into law. Um, it's the expiration what that does is it's driving more R and D, US R and D offshore because companies can't rely on it. Companies take a hit on the quarterly earnings reports. We see that seen it this year, we've seen it back in 2006 when it was expired, back in 2008 when it was expired. Um, I think we're in a very different climate right now with the payment deficit, the record high deficit in debt. And so I am not certain that the RMB credit will be extended by Congress. And all I have to do is point to the state tax. And the fact that Congress let that last last year, I mean, I think anyone in this town who works with state taxation would argue that Congress would never have let that year last and be in the predicament we are in now. So I hear the same thing with R&D credit, that it's going to last. And I just ask that, um, given the administration's support, um, the tax extenders bill is stalled in the Senate. It's been stalled in the Senate for like, the past three, four weeks. Um, there's no nothing nearby in the near future that it's going to move. And so anything the administration can do at this point to get that R&D credit renewed retroactively to January 1st, that would be greatly appreciated. So it's just a comment and thank you. Thank you. And that's actually a good shout out to good OECD data, which uh, show that we are behind on the R&D credit. Uh, maybe had some other um, funding we're ahead, but still on the I'm Chris Hill at George Mason University. I actually like to ask Andy a tough question. He's got a chart that he showed us. So he only accepts easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> that shows that the U.S. is way over on the left hand in terms of its investment, public investment in business uh, <coughs> R&D, that's what you're charged doing. And then you add the R&D credit on top of it, it's a small increment. But what you don't do, at least in that chart and in your uh, judgment report, is explain that that U.S. investment in business performed for certain development is almost entirely defensive phase. That's not like almost everybody else on that. Did you look at what it looks like if you take the Texas space out and you put it on a comparable basis with places like Finland and Japan and Germany? And wouldn't we basically fall through the floor if you did that? Yeah, I think you mean the, the government side, Chris. Government, you're, government you're right. Well, you're, you're right, Chris. Uh, we didn't. We could. Uh, and we will. You're like, and you're right. Um, a lot of those countries on the left-hand side have big defense. You saw France there as well, Sweden, uh, a lot of those countries on the left-hand side have big defense. Saw France there as well, Sweden. Uh, these are countries that have uh, uh, big um, military industrial complex. So, uh, yeah, uh, we won't get into the. Sometimes this data is, is hard. We have to go to the, to the budgetary all allocations to, to pull that out, but it can be done. Um, I think it, it would make this debate a lot more clear. Would you put in 6.3 into that? I'm sorry, uh, there's 616263, 
country is development of a weapon system. It's sometimes counted as R&D in the federal statistics. You got me on this one, Rob. I don't know. I would have to go back. Because that, that, that's hard for us to say how 6-3 does. But 6-1, 6-2 certainly does. I'll just make, if I make one comment on this. We did commit to doing this uh, in this year. Uh, Peter Orzag announced this in June that uh, I'll be leading an effort to create an R&D dashboard that will bring greater transparency to what we're actually doing with the R&D funds that we're investing. So questions like this, and Rob would stump you next time on the 616263 framework. Uh, but actually, it raises an interesting question about the, the R relative to the D. Uh, so I would just make that one point. I don't think I've ever stumped Andy on data questions. Oh, good day to day. Yes, sir. Um, I'm, my name's uh, Timothy Tardibona from Connect out of San Diego, uh, Director of Emerging Technologies. We have now opened a DC office, so we can be here in these conversations more often, and I'm, I'm the director of the office. Um, what's been a little bit missing in this discussion today that I haven't heard much about is American patent system, and particularly the dysfunction of the patent office. Uh, Dave Kaplis has done a great job starting to turn the ship, but we have over a million applications sitting in Alexandria waiting to be examined and either issued or denied, which to connect represents a lot of startup technologies um, that are waiting to get that IP so they can go to, to get funders. And but the problem is the patent reform deals with litigation reform yep. bill. It does not address the patent office's funding yep. problem. They're, 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 these are the two challenges, and the president has certainly been calling for uh, a, a thoughtful approach on patent reform, but there is bipartisan agreement that we take what is today a three-year backlog on patents down to uh, 10 months is the performance goal the President has set for the Commerce Department. Part of what the President had done in establishing these new positions, he's appointed a Chief Performance Officer, who was my colleague for nearly 10 years at the Advisory Board, Jeff Zients, our CEO with exceptional private sector experience. He serves as the nation's chief performance officer. My colleague, who was my deputy in Virginia and is now the chief information officer, Vivek Kundra, uh, who is going to help manage the govern the $80 billion of IT spend. Myself, Jeff, and Vivek have been actively engaged with the patent office under Dave's leadership to make sure that we bring the best thinking to bear on how they operationally move towards a transformed environment and we are committed to making this happen. We're obviously hopeful that there are resources that can be made available. That is a conversation that's taking place on the Hill. But three year backlog, the 10 months, focus, execution, we're gonna bring our best thinking to that challenge. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Vijay Vipis Warren from The Economist. Oh, here we go, this is <laughs> the tough one. Come on, come on. Uh, first of all, congratulations on a, a thought provoking panel. Um, a question actually for, for Andrew. You had talked about um, with your topology of, of innovation, how innovation is shifting towards more open networked approaches, uh, and there's evidence of this on the ground. Um, uh, Anish gave an example of the NIH working on medical devices, a small example, I think you would admit, but a step in that direction. Is your instinct that this is something that government can help with, either by doing things that are different than what it's doing now, national policy could somehow encourage this trend, or is it essentially something bottom up, something that companies do, and that, that really is not, is, even though innovation is changing, government can't really do much to help or hinder? I, I think the main role for governments here is, uh, I think what Ambassador Cornblow was talking about, and Abraham Lincoln and so forth, are creating these platforms that, that, that allow a, a kind of a shared infrastructure that these companies can, can use, and then they, you know, some of them actually increase collaboration and connections such as uh, broadband networks and so forth. But these, these data platforms that are being I think are, are another example, and at least for me sitting in Paris, I think they're less tested, it's less obvious, but I think a great um, potential. Uh, there are some implications, which maybe I would leave to a niche for uh, intellectual property as you go toward more collaborative and shared um, systems, uh, particularly when it's a comfort. But uh, I think the, the patent systems and what we would call knowledge networks and market are capable of, of sorting these out, but may evolve in, in evolution of this. <coughs> David, you want to say something on that? I, I, I think we're going to, sorry, I think we're going to cut it off just because we're on time, but I, I did want to respond, I did want to respond to your point. If you think about innovation as sort of collaborative innovation, that's certainly one model, I actually think there's an enormous amount that government could do. Uh, if you look at what other countries are doing right now, and I think actually leading the U.S., you take a country like 
France was just, as part of tax reform, instituted a 60% flat credit for collaborative R&D. So if you're a company in France and you invest at a university or a research laboratory, you don't get 60% on a increment of it. You get 60% credit on every dollar you do. Uh, the, I believe the South Korea has a little bit more generous credit. I believe the Duck. I get all my data from OECD. So uh, Canada. Actually, I'm sharing a good example. If you're not, if you're a, uh, an American company, mid-sized small company, you go to Ontario, you get 50% credit if you do research at a university in Ontario. 50%. Here in the U.S., you actually get a worse credit. You know, if you're a company in the U.S. and you go to MIT or Caltech or Stanford, your credit is worse than if you do it internally, uh, which I can go into why that's the case. It's just bizarre economically because the spillovers of research are much bigger when you're doing it outside your firm, therefore the credit should be bigger. So you can do things like that. You can do things like encourage more university industry collaboration through your science funding, which we do a little bit of, uh, but not anywhere near as much as we could. <laughs> And then obviously the things that the Andy talked about when the, the work that Anisha is doing on the, the data and collaboration. So there's a whole suite of things, and I think we're all learning more about how do you do that as we go forward. So we promised to end at 4, and then we promised it at 4.15, so I'm actually going to keep that second promise, and it's 4.15. But I want to um, I want to uh, really thank uh, Ambassador Farnbu for, for her leadership here, and, and Andy for the great data work, and obviously Anish for uh, do you like ever sleep? I just asked my question. Right. I don't think you do. You have a small child now too, so yes. you probably never sleep. So we have a lot of fun work to do. Well, that's I don't good. believe in the decelerating and depressing nature that Ezra has. I actually have faith that we're going to get a lot done. So <laughs> on the innovation side. Well, we at least get a lot done in, 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 in the administration, but we don't have to pass a law. We <laughs> do it on our own, and that's when we get a lot done. So hopefully, we'll be able to pass some laws as well. Uh, I guess the Senate marks up competes uh, tomorrow, so uh, it's just a competes act for time to come. So hopefully that'll go well. And then uh, obviously, Ezra, great. Thank you for really insightful comments and sharing your your thoughts here. So please join me in thanking you really. Much.